Hello again, welcome back. It's good to see some of you have come back. That's excellent. Um, just to say, um, this is an opportunity for a little LICC pitch. Um, so um, we'd love to, um, we're obviously connected with you as a church, love to be connected with you as individuals. If um, you're interested in LICC and what we're up to, um, please take one of those cards. And I've also got a little sign up thing and we can add you to a, a email bulletin for you to, to get info from us. Um, I've brought a couple of resources uh, this uh, today. Um, one of the things we try and do is encourage people to see the Bible through whole life eyes. So the idea being that sometimes we don't really connect the Bible with our everyday front line. So how can we do that? And so we've produced uh, a series called the Gateway 7, seven Bible studies that are great either for individuals or home groups. If you're interested in having those, this is Mark, but I also see there's Revelation over there for those that are wanting something a little bit more challenging. Um, they are available and um, they are 4.99. should you wish it. I can kind of deal with that and you know, take all sorts of payments if you like. And then the other thing is some of you have mentioned this. This is um, a book that was published just in the aftermath of the Queen's death. Um, it's called A Life of Grace. The extraordinary thing about this book is within a few weeks, it sold 38,000 copies. Um, and the idea is it draws attention to um, the significance of the Christian faith in, in the life of, of the Queen. And people have found this is a great thing to give to friends and neighbors who might be interested in the Queen, but have no interest really in the Christian faith, but it's a very easy way in. Anyway, I've brought those available, um, and uh, they're only, would you believe, at four pounds each. So if you would like to take one of those, you are. There's some other things that are free, but just to let you know, I'll be around, and there'll be a little sign-up sheet if you're just wanting to remain on our um, uh, system so that you can hear what's going on with LICC in the future. That is the end of um, the little commercial break. Uh, we come now to part two of our focus on confidence. And I want us to consider in this session confidence in everyday life. This is a theme um, that is explored right throughout Scripture, but not least by the Apostle Paul in his letter to the Philippians. So that's where I want to start today. And I want us to focus on Philippians chapter 2. This is one of four letters, uh, the others being Ephesians and Colossians and Philemon, that Paul penned whilst he was in prison probably in Rome or Ephesus in around 62 AD. And that itself is striking, is it not? Is it not at least interesting that Paul should choose to write on the subject of confidence whilst he's locked up in jail? I, I don't know if I'd have gotten there, but Paul does. It seems that Paul doesn't allow the circumstances of his life to determine the extent of his confidence in Jesus or the good news of Jesus and this clearly gives credibility as we shall see to his teaching so let's listen again to Philippians from David Suchet uh, Philippians chapter 2 verses 2 to 16 thank you Philippians chapter 2 therefore if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ if any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and of one mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of the others. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge 
that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill his good purpose. Do everything without grumbling or arguing, so that you may become blameless and pure, children of God without fault in a warped and crooked generation. Then you will shine among them like stars in the sky as you hold firmly to the word of life. And then I will be able to boast on the day of Christ that I did not run or labor in vain. I want us to start this session by thinking about stars, and not these ones, uh, although I have to admit that I actually have no idea who the majority of these people are, but I have a, under good authority that they are celebrities, they are in fact stars. Um, they are not the stars that I want us to think about at the beginning of uh, this session. Rather, I'd like us to think about these stars um, that are utterly extraordinary, are they not? We, we live in the most extraordinary universe, uh, don't we? And uh, just think about these stars. Those white dots uh, are stars. Uh, they are these huge celestial bodies made uh, mostly of hydrogen and helium that produce light and heat from these churning nuclear forges that they have deep within their cores. It's utterly extraordinary. When we look up into the night sky and see stars, that is what we're seeing. It's incredible, isn't it? Aside from the sun, the dots of light we see in the sky are all light years from Earth. I still find that a very difficult thought to comprehend. And they're the building blocks, these stars, of galaxies of which there are billions in the universe. It's impossible to know how many exist exactly, but astronomers estimate that in our Milky Way galaxy alone, there are about 300 billion stars. Isn't that extraordinary? And depending on cloud cover, depending where you're standing, you might be able to see countless numbers of stars in the sky, or you might see absolutely nothing at all. It just depends on where you are at any point in time. I remember, by the way, noticing a couple of things when we moved from central London to Swindon about 12 years ago. Um, the first thing that I noticed was that people walked much more slowly. I thought that really interesting. So people walked more slowly. And then the second thing was at night time, I could see stars in the sky. There just wasn't the artificial light uh, where, where we are compared with all the artificial light that there was and is in central London. It was incredible. So imagine, if you will, what the night sky would have looked like in the first century before any artificial light pollution. Imagine the Apostle Paul looking into the night sky. It's not surprising that he uses this analogy, does he, to describe how the Christians at Philippi are to be. <coughs> Paul exhorts them to shine like stars in the universe as they cling on to the word of life. Jesus said to his disciples, you are the salt of the earth. You are light, the light of the world. And Paul, perhaps reflecting on that, says to the Philippian Christians, you're to shine. You're to shine like stars in the universe, in a universe that is often dark and complex. The Christians in Philippi are to shine. That's Paul's vision. But here's the thing, the Christians at Philippi, they struggled they struggle. Paul recognizes that this is a struggle for them. The Christians at Philippi, they struggled to relate the gospel to their everyday lives and work. They were living in a pagan culture, unsure of themselves, cagey about living publicly for Christ. They lacked 
confidence. And so Paul has to remind them in part of the letter that comes before the part that we read that their public behavior, their life in this city needs to match up with the good news of Jesus. Paul has to remind the Christians at Philippi that there's a different way to live. He has to remind them that their task is to show the world that there is a different way to live, a different way of being human, a way that looks like Jesus. The Philippians need to step up into this vision. And the sense that I have as I come to you this morning is that Paul's message is exactly the same for you and me here in High Wycombe today. We are to shine like stars in our culture. We're to shine like stars when we're gathered together like this today, but we're also to shine like stars when we're engaged in our own everyday front lines in the different spaces and places we live and work and show up. Of course, like the Philippians, we can struggle can't we? We can struggle living in a culture that is often apathetic at best and hostile at worst to the good news of Jesus. And the result of that is that we can be unsure of ourselves. We can be cagey about living publicly for Jesus. But we need to show High Wycombe that there's a different way of being human. And that way of being human is the way of Jesus. So how can we grow in confidence? The Apostle Paul reminds the Christians in Philippi that they can be confident in living as followers of Jesus, not because of their faith per se, but because of who God is. That's a really important principle for us to grasp hold of this morning. It is because they're children of God, explains the Apostle Paul, that they can shine like stars in the universe. Paul talks about them shining like stars in the universe as they cling on to the word of life. And who is the word of life? The word of life is Jesus. As we cling on to Jesus, we can shine like stars in our everyday context. Well, at LICC, we've developed um, a little framework that is designed to help us do this very practically, and it's called the six M's, and a few of you might have come across it before, but it's a really helpful way of seeing how God is already working through us and those we know, and also a really useful way of then inspiring, inspiring our imaginations as to how God might do that in the future, how God might do that in you and through you on your front line, whatever the context that is, it is on Monday. So let me go uh, through, there are six as you can see here. The first is modeling godly character. Uh, Oh, if you, just back to the list where they all are, please. There we are, thank you. Um, The second is making good work, ministering grace and love, molding culture, being a mouthpiece for truth and justice, being a messenger for the gospel. So the idea is whoever you are, wherever you are, whether you're in your neighborhood, whether you're in your local community, whether you're going into a shopping, uh, a supermarket, whether you are in a place of work or a place of education, um, this is a framework that will help us live as disciples of Jesus within that context. So then let's please kick off with the first M. So this is modeling godly character. This is one way that we can shine like stars. Whatever we do, wherever we are, we're reflecting the character of God or we're not. Um, what, What could that look like? What could it look like for you to model godly character? Think of a context that you will be in Um, It might be before Monday, but let's just imagine. Monday morning, imagine a context that you will be in. What might it look like to model godly character in that environment? Maybe it will be displaying self-control and keeping a cool head when everyone around you 
is, is not. <laughs> or, or, or maybe you're in a situation where you are serving someone in a shop and you need to uh, uh, display self-control and keep a cool head when you're being provoked um, by a customer who's very difficult and who's completely unreasonable. And you know the customer isn't always right, um, but you know that you can't kind of ever say that exactly. And so you've got to demonstrate godly character. What might that look like for you? Um, this is Jess. Her name is uh, Jess Kahn. She is a friend of mine, and she is a physician associate at St. George's Hospital in London. I've only got to know her relatively recently. And recently, she was in a situation at work where a uh, junior doctor rang her and her department for some advice. And also in the room where Jess was, was her senior colleague. And uh, the, the ward was busy that they were on, and the senior colleague simply came over to the phone, grabbed it from Jess, slammed it down, and said, we're too busy. And uh, Jess um, didn't think that was a great response. So how did she model godly character in that situation? Well, she knew that the ward was busy, um, but she found a moment when she could ring back that junior doctor. She knew that the question that the junior doctor had for her was really significant, was actually a very easy query to resolve, and the information that Jess had would allow a patient to be released from hospital immediately. So it would make a big difference. So Jess called back the colleague, apologized for the behavior of her senior colleague, gave the answer that was needed, and that made a massive difference to the junior doctor and the patient. That might seem quite kind of everyday, but that is the point. In an everyday way, Jess is seeking to shine like a star in that environment. I've known, I'm known as someone who brings love, joy, and kindness into work, Jess told me. New colleagues often say, I've heard about you. you good, you're good to work with. You bring the mood up. Amazing. It's amazing, isn't it? Jess has grasped this vision, what it is to shine like a star in the universe, and is being intentional about being a disciple of Jesus in that way. I mean, imagine if our reputation as Christians was that we were good to work with, that we would bring the mood up. Do you know, that, that isn't always the experience that people have of Christians. Paul invites us to, to do a work as disciples of Jesus and to shine like stars. Um, I don't know if you'll recognize this uh, photograph. This is someone called Stanley Hauerwas. Does anyone recognize him? I, there's no reason why you should, but he's an ethicist. I mean, you might, I think he's a Methodist as well as an ethicist. Um, and he's, he's a theologian. And uh, he once gave what is probably on record as being the shortest speech at Aberdeen University during a graduation ceremony. And the essence of the speech was this. I've remembered it off my heart. Do not lie. Do not lie. It might seem so simple, but if we didn't lie, if we were people who were immersed in the truth and were known to be truthful, that would make a big difference. That would be modeling godly character. Now, there are ways to tell the truth. And uh, sometimes my sense of us as Christians is it's not really what we say that is offensive. It's just we're offensive. Um, but there's something in what Hava says. You know, I've, I mean, I'm sure Malcolm is different. I've never known, just between ourselves, um, I've never known a leader of the church underestimate the number of people on Alpha or the number of people who have become Christians in Alpha is extraordinary. Their, their, their sort of figure is always slightly more than it is. And of course, we who are not leading churches also have our version of that. Uh, how vast reminds us the way of Jesus is tell the truth. Tell the truth. What an amazing way to model something of God's character. The second M is making good work. So what does this mean? This means knowing that everything that we do Everything is to and for the glory of God. Um, what happens on Monday matters 
to God. And we can do everything, the fun, the interesting, the big, the small, the mundane, and the just plain boring, to the glory of God. It's an extraordinary thing. We can do everything to the glory of God. Everything matters. Everything truly matters to God. This, I think, sometimes involves us having what some people would describe as a a paradigm shift. Paradigm shift is just a completely different way of thinking about things. And we need that that shift to, to remind ourselves that everything matters to God. The best example of a paradigm shift I can give us this morning is from a a book written by Stephen Covey. Um, And I think he brilliantly describes what a truly radical change of mind involves. And I'd just love to read this to you. So this is from uh, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, um, and it's by Stephen Covey. And he writes that he remembers a particular paradigm shift that he experienced one Sunday morning on a subway in New York. Um, He was on the subway, um, we might refer to it as the tube, um, and people were sitting quietly, some reading newspapers, others lost in thought, some resting their eyes, um, closing their eyes. It was a calm, it was a peaceful scene, and then suddenly a man and his children entered the subway car. The children were so loud um, that the whole climate changed in an instant. It went from being peaceful to being um, quite traumatic. Um, And the man sat down with the children, sat down next to Stephen and closed his eyes, apparently completely oblivious to the situation. The children were yelling back and forth, throwing things, even grabbing people's newspapers. It was um, a really disturbing scene. And yet the man that sat next to Stephen did absolutely nothing at all. This is what Stephen writes. It was difficult not to feel irritated. I could not believe that he could be so insensitive as to let his children run wild like that and do nothing about it, taking no responsibility at all. It was easy to see that everyone else on the subway felt irritated too. And so, finally, with what I felt was unusual patience and restraint, I turned to him and said, Sir, your children are really disturbing a lot of people. I wonder if you couldn't control them a little more. The man lifted his gaze as if to come to consciousness of the situation for the first time and said softly, oh, you're right, I guess. I should do something about it. We just came from the hospital where their mother died about an hour ago. I don't know what to think, and I guess they don't know how to handle it either. Can you imagine the difference that that made? For Stephen, in an instant, his perception of the situation had changed. His paradigm had shifted. Suddenly, he saw things differently. And because he saw differently, he started to think differently. He felt differently. He behaved differently. His irritation vanished. He didn't have to worry about controlling his attitude or behavior because suddenly his heart was full with the man's pain and feelings of sympathy and compassion replaced any emotions that he'd previously had. And so he turns to the man and he said, oh, your wife, she's just died. He says, I'm so sorry. Can you tell me about it? What can I do to help? And in a second, in an instant, everything changed. That is um, profound, isn't it? But Paul, in his letter, is inviting us to change our mindset similarly, uh, to think differently about who we are, who God is, what everyday life is like. And, And part of that involves us understanding that everything matters to God. Everything matters to God. Everything that we do matters to God. Packing shelves feels different if we feel that we're packing shelves for the glory of God and the service of others. One of the first jobs that I had was uh, involved, um, this wasn't the whole job, but it was an element of it, uh, binding induction packs for staff. Um, It was tedious, it was boring, and in all honesty, I, I confess to you this morning that I resented it. I resented the fact that this was part of my job. Imagine, though, 
the difference it would have made to me and maybe others and maybe the quality of my work if I'd had a vision that everything I did was for the glory of God and that Jesus was asking me, calling me to do good work, produce good work with and for him. I uh, used to work for a think tank called Theos and one day in our early days, um, I had a phone call from an advertising agency in the United States asking if I could help with a new campaign they were running. I was intrigued. Uh, what was the campaign? Well, they couldn't tell me the precise details. It was commercially sensitive, but they could tell me that the advertising campaign was for a men's cosmetic. And the idea of the campaign was that if men use this particular product, they would become irresistible to women. Interesting, I thought, what do you want me to do? Um, the challenge, they said, is we think this campaign could be controversial, um, particularly for those who have a faith, and perhaps especially a Christian faith. And why is that, I said? Well, they said, because the idea is that if men use this product, it's not only women that will find them irresistible, but even angels will fall um, because of, 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 of what's going on. And they wanted me to write a little paper, short theological paper, to give basically the green light to this advertising campaign. It, it needn't be a long paper, um, I was told. Um, just a couple of pages is absolutely fine. And of course, they would pay me. And I said, oh, that'd be interesting, what, what, what would you pay? Oh, well, we've got um, a budget of 10,000 pounds. Would that be enough? Um, and I thought about it. I thought, well, to be honest, I could kind of draw up that um, couple of sides within probably about 20 minutes. And we, we could really do with 10,000 pounds. But I couldn't do it. Couldn't do it. Because it didn't seem like good work to me didn't really seem to me that that would be for the glory of God or the life of the world. And so you can imagine, ladies and gentlemen, my great interest a few months later when I happened to see this advert. I, by the way, I, I thought whether I should show this in Union Baptist Church, High Wycombe, this morning. Um, uh, but I, I've taken a risk. So we'll see if it, if, if it pulls off, if we could have the advert. Thank you. Possibly, possibly the worst advert I think I've ever seen in my life. Um, I'm tempted to say that I've got links uh, available afterwards, but that, that, that would neither be true nor appropriate. Um, but they said, oh, I just couldn't, it wasn't good work. It wasn't life-giving. Um, I, wonder, I wonder if you'd agree with me. Um, so that's the second M, making uh, good work. What about the third M? This is ministering grace and love. This is found in, in the boss who doesn't just fire someone but offers support um, and perhaps comfort in a redundancy meeting and maybe even follows up afterwards. Um, this, is, this could be as simple as offering a 
a timely cup of coffee to someone who is struggling, taking 10 minutes out of your day to talk stuff over with someone, ministering grace and love. If we, if we want to shine like stars, as followers of Jesus, we, need to, we have the opportunity to, to minister grace and love. The fourth M is molding culture. Uh, we can mold the culture of the places in which we live and work just by making small changes that in some ways reflect something more of the life of Jesus. What could this look like for you in your situation? I mean, it, it could be um, quenching gossip with a positive word for the person who's always the butt of jokes. Um, it, it could be championing truth and honesty in a department in which you're working, or it could be um, nurturing a safe space for the rest of the team to thrive in. Uh, or, or it could be that you know, your, your approach is to counter the blame culture of the corporate world by admitting when you've made a mistake and offering forgiveness to someone who's made a mistake also. When have you molded culture? I'm sure that you, you have. I, one of the, the best pieces of leadership advice I was ever given by someone was never be the last person to wash the dishes up. Never be the last person to wash the dishes up. Um, now, am I always the first person at work to wash the dishes up? No, I'm not. But I, I seek not to be the last, to often do that, to do the stuff that other people want, don't want to do, because that's the way I can mould the culture. I have a friend uh, whose name is James. He used to be a partner in one of the big law firms in London. He was challenged, perhaps at a, a day a bit like this, as to how he might integrate his faith and work. And he resolved one day that he was going to do something about this. He was going to be determined to model God's character uh, within his workplace to, to mold uh, the culture, to change the culture. So on Monday morning, he decides he's going to go and have a conversation with the senior partners, the other senior partners, and he gets into the office, uh, he takes the escalator, um, and then he takes the lift up a further floor, he gets to the top floor. Of course he's gone to the top floor because that's where he works and all the other partners work too. Um, and he gets through, he walks through the various offices ready to confront his fellow partners, to challenge them about the culture of his law firm. And then he realizes what he's just done. And what had he just done? He had walked past five more junior members of staff without even acknowledging their existence. And so do you know what he did? He turned round, he took the lift to the bottom floor, he went out of the building of the law firm, and he started again. He enters the entrance and goes up to the receptionist at the desk and says, I'm really sorry, I just realized that I walked past you this morning without even acknowledging your existence. He said, the worst thing is I've realized that I've done that for the last 10 years. He said, I am so sorry. My name's James. What's your name? From that day, James started to change the culture of his law firm. As he tried to mold it in a way that reflected something of the life of Jesus. How might you do that where you are on Monday morning? The fifth M is being a mouthpiece for truth and justice. That sounds quite a lofty ideal, doesn't it? But wherever, whatever, whether we realize it or not, this is something that we get to engage in every single day. It can be as simple as speaking up for a colleague who has been overlooked or it could be bigger, ruling our patch, the area of responsibility that God's given us and, and ruling it well. It could involve making sure that other people get the credit they deserve when we could have taken the credit ourselves. Big or small, being a mouthpiece for truth and justice looks like standing up, often at personal cost, to promote good and fair and just practices. 
This is a photograph of Catherine. She's another friend of mine. She works for the Crown Prosecution Service in communications. Catherine is totally committed and motivated by a God who himself is committed to putting the world to rights, a God who is committed to justice. And Catherine seeks to ensure that the organization that she's part of plays its part in that. And she seeks to be a mouthpiece for truth and justice. And one of the things that she does within her little team is to make sure that other people get credit for the work they've done, when often they would be the people that are overlooked. She calls it out. Um, they uh, award it. Um, and it makes a difference. It makes a difference. Small, but one way in which Catherine seeks to be a mouthpiece for truth and justice. That's the fifth M. And then there's the sixth M, which is being a messenger for the gospel. Of course, the reality is, if we're living this life, we're a messenger of the gospel through all of our life. Um, but this seeks to draw attention to the use of our mouths, how we might speak of Jesus, how we might talk about Jesus in our everyday lives. A friend of my wife, uh, Ruth, who's not a Christian, uh, told another friend of Ruth's, also not a Christian, who was experiencing a serious trauma, to tell Ruth about it because she will pray for you. Isn't that interesting? Someone who has no Christian faith at all, telling another person who has no Christian faith at all to speak to someone who's a follower of Jesus because they will pray for you. Uh, Weirdly, that person who's not a Christian was a mouthpiece for the gospel. Um, but it also then gave Ruth an opportunity to speak into that situation. I have a friend of mine called Russell who was going through a very difficult time and uh, really struggling to see where God was in his life and situation. And he, one morning, was praying about this in his front room and asking God to show up in what was a, a really difficult time for him, and asking God to show him that he loved him. If you're real God, Russell said, I want you to show me that you love him. Russell then gets his jacket on, he opens the front door, he goes down the road to catch the tube. And then someone crosses over from the other side of the road and stops him and says, excuse me, I'm sorry to trouble you, I just need you to know that God loves you very much. Extraordinary thing. Extraordinary example of someone on their front line being a messenger for the gospel. The extraordinary thing too is that when I heard Russell tell me that, I thought a couple of things at exactly the same time. The first was, why doesn't God do that to me? And the second was, I'd like God to show me that he loves me. <laughs> and I heard God say to me at that time, Paul, you don't need me to do that for you right now. You know that I love you. You've got so much evidence of it. And then a few weeks later, I was on the tube, and I heard God say to me, tell the person opposite that I love them. And do you know what I did? Absolutely nothing at all. Because I was scared. I was scared. I didn't want to look an idiot. I didn't want to appear stupid or, or odd. Jesus calls us to be messengers for the gospel on our everyday front lines. A friend of mine, here he is, a photo, his name's Massimo, he's been a builder for 33 years. And he often sings whilst he's at work, who you say I am, a child of God, that's one of his favorites. People sometimes ask him about what he's singing and, and why he's singing, and this gives him this amazing opportunity to talk about 
Jesus. He had a client recently who swore using Jesus' name, and Massimo, in that situation, he just asked the client respectfully if he wouldn't do that, and the client responded really angrily, saying that he had the right to do exactly what he wanted to in his house. That is true, said Massimo, but he loves you. And that guy is still one of his regular clients. Massimo, taking seriously this challenge of Jesus to be a messenger of the gospel on his front line. Uh, I've got a couple of films I just want to show you, but we'll just show you one because of time. So I'd love to show you the film of Jessica. So this is Jessica. She's a bridal wear designer. And this is how she seeks to practice these six M's in her life and work. Thank you. Sorry, Philippa. Her name's Philippa. So this, I'm sure I've... Philippa Long is an independent designer and maker of bridal wear. And for her, in such a competitive business, fruitfulness in Christ comes in many forms. After a 22-hour shift in the run-up to London Fashion Week, modelling godly character requires a big dollop of self-control with colleagues and machines. But in a tough, fast, sometimes cruel culture, kindness and gentleness radiate out of Philippa. For her, work is worship. So making good work is about being rigorous technically and adventurous creatively, aspiring to excellence because God deserves our best. It's respecting the fabric, ensuring that the garment fully expresses the idea in her mind and truly suits the woman buying it something beautiful that brings out her beauty. Ministering Grace and Love is about helping women choose a design that gives them the confidence to be themselves, to be the bride they want to be, not conform to other people's expectations of what a bride should look like. She's moulded a hospitality culture, creating a warm, safe space for customers, colleagues and suppliers. She's a mouthpiece for truth and justice, a champion for sustainable, body-positive fashion, designing wedding garments that aren't just for the one big day, or that require women to diet themselves into a body shape that isn't really them. And for her, being a messenger of the gospel means nurturing relationships, asking questions, listening, and then being asked questions that enable her to share who she really is, a dedicated follower of Jesus. What does living the six M's of fruitfulness look like for you? Thank you. So as we close the session, there are just two or three things I'd love to, to leave us with. The first is that these six M's, they all work together. They're all part of our life with God and witnessing to a God who is at work in the world around us. And of course, hearing about a God of love becomes a lot more believable when you've seen someone who claims to follow God living life in ways that are deeply loving. A God of justice makes so much more sense when you've seen a follower of Jesus standing up in the face of unfair practice. So these things work together if we're going to shine like stars in the universe, that's the first thing. The second thing is, it is true to say that we can be confident because of who God is and what God has done and the fact that God is with us. But there's also reason to be confident because those around us don't always think in the way we expect them to think and act. And I have a, a kind of a hunch that quite a lot of us imagine our neighbors and colleagues and friends who we interact with during the working week to be kind of maybe slightly friendlier versions of, of people like Richard Dawkins and other public atheists who are, are really clear that God doesn't exist and want absolutely nothing to do <coughs> with that non-existent God. But the reality is most people are not like that. Most people are more open to the gospel than we could conceivably imagine. Look at these stats. 
So these are stats that show how your neighbors feel about you. This was a survey um, of many thousands of people that was conducted. And it was a survey that was conducted with those that would not describe themselves as Christians, so non-Christians, following a conversation that they had with a neighbor who was a Christian. 75% of the non-Christians felt comfortable in a conversation with a Christian about the Christian faith. Does that not strike you as extraordinary? I mean, I kind of believe it if it was 75% felt uncomfortable. But 75% felt comfortable, that is interesting. Now, by the way, there are some really bad examples where they felt deeply uncomfortable, but most people feel comfortable, open to hearing about someone's faith. Secondly, 40% of those non-Christian neighbors felt closer to their Christian neighbor after that conversation. So if you're avoiding having that conversation because you don't want to put barriers up, and you don't want to appear weird, the evidence suggests that actually there's quite a high likelihood that your, your neighbor, your colleague, your friend will feel closer to you. And then 33% wanted to know more about Jesus after that conversation. 33%, that's quite high, isn't it? So what's the worst that could happen? Like me on the tube, you might not want to look stupid, you might not want to appear odd, but the evidence is that those whom we live and work and relate to amongst us are more open to Jesus than we think they are. That's another reason for us to be confident. Confident in the good news of Jesus. Confident as we seek to shine like stars. As we close, I'd love to read the words of an an ancient prayer. This is from someone called Ignatius, who may be familiar to you. But it's a way of us, in a way, commissioning ourselves to what we've talked about that what we're doing in the everyday really matters and that Jesus invites us to live as disciples of Jesus in that. So let me pray um, this for us as we recommit ourselves to God and the work that God has given us to do. Let us pray. Teach us, good Lord, to serve thee as thou deservest, to give and not to count the cost, to fight and not to heed the wounds, to toil and not to seek for rest, to labor and not to ask for any reward, save that of knowing that we do thy will. May it be so. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Well, thank-